Well, thank you very much, Lynn, and thanks to the organizer for uh, inviting me. Uh, I think I have how long? Like 50 minutes, an hour, something like that? Um, anyway, if, uh, I'm happy to answer questions in between, uh, especially if you need you know, the answer to something to keep understanding what's coming up next. So this is uh, a work that uh, actually has been done with uh, some collaborators. You may recognize some of these faces, uh, people at Google, uh, like Ryan, Robin, Dominique, also uh, in Sydney, and, uh, and Nathan, who's in the University of Toronto. So we posted a paper back in March or April, I think. So what I'm going to give today is going to be a summary of this work. And I'm going to try to build the concepts kind of like you know, from the bottom up, so it's easy to understand what's going on. All right. So what is, uh, you know, at the high level, what we did? Well, we constructed, you know, uh, a new quantum algorithm that provides an exponential speed up, okay? So uh, the quantum algorithm actually solves an interesting problem, which is the simulation of the dynamics of a classical system, okay? And, uh, and this classical system is going to be made out of exponentially many coupled masses, you know, with springs and so on. So think of a very, very large classical system where there are particles that might be vibrating and so on. So that's what we simulate, the dynamics of that. We're expecting that this is going to uh, result in a new application of, of quantum computers beyond quantum simulation. Okay? So um, you know, we are thinking about the things. Uh, we still don't have really full flesh out application for it, but we are getting there. And uh, at, or at the very least, we think that it will provide a new way of thinking about some quantum algorithms, and we have evidence of that, and I'll mention it. So like any other quantum algorithm out there, uh, this algorithm is going to be efficient under assumptions. Uh, but you know, we prove at the same time that this is the best a quantum computer can do. If you try to you know, modify the problem, and ask for a bit more, like better precision or something like that, then that's going to render the algorithm inefficient. So this is the basic quantum computer can do. And uh, I'll explain how we, we get to, to a profile like that. All right. So why this is important? Well, quantum computers you know, can, can, can uh, solve certain problems exponentially faster. There's a number of quantum algorithms out there with different speed ups, around 30 quantum algorithms or so, from the latest uh, information in the Quantum Algorithm Zoo website. So in that sense, we provided one more. Most such quantum algorithms may never find applications. Uh, however, you know, many systems are modeled uh, as many classical couple oscillators. We expect that ours will indeed find such applications. And uh, I'll make a few comments on this remark later. More on the research side, we establish uh, a connection between classical and quantum dynamics that uh, will be used, you know, uh, likely to prove uh, related complexity results in the future. And uh, historically, at least in my experience, new quantum algorithm ideas are sometimes used in more general contexts. So LCO, linear combination of unitaries, quantum signal processing are, are examples where what we were looking for at that time were faster algorithms for simulating quantum dynamics. These techniques nowadays are used pretty much for any quantum algorithm that tries to solve a linear algebra problem. So there's a chance that this will happen here as well. All right. OK, so to be able to simulate exponentially many classical oscillators, so I'll use big N for a very, very large number, little n. Uh, basically, uh, 2 to the little n is going to be big N. Uh, in time polynomial in little n, we will need to define what we mean by simulation precisely. Uh, if I had to identify each oscillator independently, then uh, you know, we're done. That uh, already requires a lot of classical information. So that wouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, couldn't be considered as the input to the problem if we want to have a, like a polynomial in little n complexity. So to get there, I will start by describing simple systems of classical oscillators. Uh, Newton's equations, normal models, and so on. And then I will present a detailed problem definitions and the results that we have in the paper and make some comments on the proof techniques. I'll sketch the proof yeah, given that I have time. 
All right. So, what is a harmonic classical harmonic oscillator? The simplest example is just a mass coupled by a spring to a wall. The mass uh, uh, is little m. Uh, x of t is going to be its displacement with respect to its equilibrium position as a function of time t. Kappa is what's called the spring constant. And Newton's equation, this is very simple. Mass times acceleration is the force. The force, in this case, is given by Hooke's law, which is proportional uh, uh, to the displacement with the, the cos of proportionality this is the spring constant with the minus sign. This is a very simple second order differential equation. The solution is almost trivial. It's this trigonometric cosine of omega t plus pi. And omega here is going to be the frequency, and the frequency is determined by the, um, the basically the parameters of the problem. In this case, it's going to be the square root of the spring constant divided by the mass. So larger spring constant oscillates faster, right? Higher frequency, the same if the mass were to be small. All right. So in physics, it's very common to um, describe the motion of a particle using what's called the phase space. In phase space, uh, this is in the plane. One coordinate map uh, represents the, the position of the particle. The other coordinate map represents the velocity of the particle. And in the case of a single mass oscillating, this is going to be a dot in that ellipse that is oscillating at the frequency omega, right? Simple change of variables. I made the ellipse. It now looks like a circle. Uh, the way that I had to do uh, the change of variables is basically by, by multiplying by, by some different constants for the position and the different constants for the velocity. And uh, that's going to be, uh, you know, again, it's phase space. And now the point is going around this circle. And if you look at the radius of the circle, it's going to be the square root of some parameter that I call E. And E is the energy of the system, OK? So the energy of uh, a mass that is oscillating is going to be a sum of the kinetic energy, half of the mass times speed squared, plus the potential energy, which is half of the spring constant times the displacement square. Okay? So this term is, again, given by Hooke's law. So now is when you look at the energy, because the system is uh, energy preserving, there is no dissipation. It is clear that this point here now describes a circle because I change basically the coordinates such that one is the square root of the kinetic term and the other coordinate is going to be the square root of the potential term. So the length of that vector is going to be the square root of the energy. So this is a very simple observation, but I'm going to use it in a more, uh, you know, more general way later to understand the results. All right. So that was a simple particle oscillating with a spring. Now, we are going to start coupling uh, different masses with different springs, different spring constants, and so on. So this is, again, it's a simple system with two masses, now connected in this way by various springs. And you can write, again, the Newton's equations using Hooke's law. These are going to be sets of uh, second order differential equations, but now the coordinates become, start to become coupled. Right? So it's not as simple as it was before to solve this more complex uh, system of differential equations. We, this is, you know, we know well that uh, systems like this give rise to what's called normal modes. These are norm, uh, modes of, of well-defined frequency, like the symmetric and anti-symmetric uh, mode, and so on. So one can still probably deal with you know, two oscillators and do the math. This is what you're going to get. Um, but, I mean, the interesting point here is that these equations start to become coupled, finding the solutions now is getting more and more complicated. And, uh, you know, another observation is that if I give you what the initial conditions, like the different displacements of the oscillators and the different velocities at time zero, then you should be able to plug in this into the equations, and you're going to give the, uh, that's going to give you the unique solution at any time, later time t. Now think of many, many, many oscillators, okay? So this is uh, a cartoon, a bunch of oscillators connected with springs. The masses might be different. The spring constants might be different. And now we're going to have these very large vectors to denote their positions and velocities at any time. Again, this big N is exponentially large in some smaller parameter, uh, little n. And um, 
The input for such a system might be like the n different values to specify all the masses, other n squared and so on values to specify all the spring constants. And what we are uh, looking for here is to get the n different coordinates that specify all the positions of the oscillators and the other that specify the velocities at any later time t. And now, I'm, you know, it's common to define something that is called the mass matrix. Basically, this matrix encodes all the masses in its diagonal entries for all the oscillators. So M1 is the mass for the first oscillator and so on. There is going to be this kappa matrix. It contains all the spring constants of any J, K mass are connected with the springs, the constant of kappa J, K. I'm going to uh, encode that in, in, such, in such a matrix. These both matrices are uh, n by n. And you know, the standard requirements is that masses are non-negative. Spring constants are also non-negative. Okay? Actually, in the, for this case, we need the masses to be positive. If you, yeah. So just to make sure I understand, so KII is the spring to the environment, right? Yes, that's right. So yeah, the kappa JJs are basically, yeah, like a spring connected to a wall or something. Yeah. It's like a self-loop in the, in the network. All right. This is a simplification of uh, Newton's equation using Hooke's law. Uh, the mass matrix acting you know, on the acceleration of each of the particles is minus times it's minus uh, a matrix F times the displacement, and this matrix F is actually very easily obtained from the matrix cap. I think the off diagonal elements are the same up to a sign, and the diagonal elements are just simple calculations from the kappa matrix. All right. So we have Newton's equation. Oh, here is explicit form uh, for the matrix F, and uh, it's also uh, useful to do a bit of change of variables, I'm going to call the coordinate y as basically something that is the square root of the mass matrix acting on the displacements of the, um, of the oscillators. And after doing all these very simple algebraic manipulations, you end up having Newton's equation in, in a simpler form for the, uh, now using the variable, uh, the coordinates y, where, um, where the matrix A is again uh, easily obtained from the, from the matrix F as defined here. All right. Okay. So some properties, because the system is non-dissipative, uh, then you can show that the matrix A is going to be positive semi-definite. All the its eigenvalues have to be non-negative. And um, it has the diagonal entries are going to be positive, strictly positive. And the off-diagonal ones here, uh, for this particular example, are going to be non-positive. The differential equation that we have here can actually be solved using a diagonalization technique. If you were to do that, that would take time that is polynomial in the dimension of the matrix. This is going to be polynomial in big N, which we're assuming is going to be exponentially large in some little n. The eigenvalues of A are the square of what we call the eigen frequencies. So there's normal modes, things that are oscillate at a, at a very well-defined frequency. A more general solution is a combination of those. Uh, the frequencies of each of those normal modes can be obtained from the eigenvalues by doing diagonalization, obtaining by doing the eigen, uh, computing the eigenvalues of A. And actually, when you get to this particular form, it's very easy to check that this is a, it's going to be a solution. Okay, the equation. So um, the solution here has like two n basically uh, entries, uh, some real ones and some uh, purely Im imaginary ones. And at any time t, the solution can be written as some exponential of i t square root of the matrix A acting uh, on the corresponding vector at time zero. So if you know what y of zero is and y dot of zero is, you plug it in here, you apply the exponential operator, and you obtain the solution at any time t. Of course, you're not going to do this because classically this could take time that is again polynomial in big N, and we're assuming that there is exponentially large. So initial conditions from the solution uh, clearly determine, um, determine the, the solution at any later time t. And as I said, computing this coordinates classically is going to take um, prohibited time, especially if this big N uh, is very large. So 
For many of you, you probably already realized that this pretty much seems to be the solution to a Schrodinger-like equation. Right? So there is an exponential operator. Now where a Hamiltonian is going to be the square root of a. That's true. And actually, the solutions that we are, uh, I'm going to show uh, are not exactly of this form. I'll, 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 um, I'll explain uh, things in detail. But I'll formalize this observation of the connection between the classical dynamics and one of quantum dynamics uh, just in a few slides. OK, so given that classical algorithms could take polynomial in n time, and that quantum computers can simulate a particular differential equation, Schrodinger's equation in particular, uh, efficiently, you can ask the following. Is there a notion of a simulation where dynamical properties of these exponentially many oscillators can be obtained in polynomial time in little n? Are there efficient quantum algorithms for that? What would be the complexity of classical algorithms for that particular problem? And this is indeed you know, uh, an interesting or practically irrelevant problem at all. I'll try to answer this. So the overall answer is yes to most of the equations. And if, there's, if you don't follow up you know, uh, what I'm going to say next, the take home message for you could be that there is indeed a, a simulation problem related to the dynamics of exponentially many classical oscillators, where the uh, coordinates are basically uh, encoding the amplitudes of a quantum state that can be solved in time polynomial in little n. For that particular simulation problem, we can show that classical algorithms could require exponential time. We can prove this. So we don't have yet a definite answer in terms of applications. We are advancing. We are making progress. But there appears that there are some interesting and practically relevant problems and good benefits from this speed up. You know, as, as I said at the, at the beginning, as most quantum algorithms for simulation, several assumptions must be made uh, to really gain, uh, use, exploit the power of, of, of this quantum algorithm, like in quantum simulation. I'm going to try to define um, the problem, again, by building concepts, uh, you know, kind of like bottom up. So, when we have this very large system of um, classical oscillators, uh, I mentioned that we are treating the system as being non-dissipative. There's going to be an energy. The energy is going to be the sum of the kinetic and the potential energies. The kinetics are, uh, terms are basically given here as half of the mass of each oscillator times speed squared. And then the potential energy is going to be the potential stored in all of the oscillators. So I have to do a sum over all K, J, all pairs, basically. Um, of masses, a sum over all springs, and contains this form. So the energy is going to be a preserved quantity by definition of the problem. So that's what's called a constant motion in physics. So you know, from this simple observation, you, one can realize that the following vector is going to preserve the length. I'm going to build a vector where its first n entries are the square root of the terms appearing in the kinetic energy. And the remaining order n square entries are going to be like the square root of the terms that are appearing in, in the potential energy. So here, this, yeah, um, the self loops should be, uh, are going to be like kappa jj times xj square. So there's a little bit of a typo here. So the length of that vector, because of the way that I constructed, is going to be the square root of the energy. The length square is the energy, so, so the length is the square root of the energy. So given that we have now that vector whose entries encode the kinetic and potential energies in the way that I explained, and that its length is preserving time, the next question is like, what is the equation that is going to govern its dynamics? So it turns out that for these particular classical systems, and a uh, little bit of a generalization where, where, um, where the system is harmonic or, or the corresponding classical Hamiltonians are quadratic function of the coordinates, the dynamics is actually determined by Schrodinger's equation. So it's unitary dynamics. The Hamiltonian that arises in the dynamics is going to be a function of uh, the matrix A. Right? I mean, the matrix A, again, depends on the masses and the spring constants and so on. Maybe this was already obvious to you when I presented the one oscillator case. And I did this trick of changing the coordinates. So if you look at this, right, and now you 
uh, encode these coordinates, say, in the state of, in the amplitude of, 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 of a single qubit state, the amplitude for zero, and this in the amplitude corresponding to one, well, this is going to be uh, basically the state of a qubit that is rotating, if you think in block sphere, where the rotation is given by, um, the, the, the speed of that rotation is going to give, be given by the exactly the same frequency that you had in the system. So in this case, this could be just a single qubit state where we did this encoding. Now this state is evolving according to a Hamiltonian, which could be a rotation where, and the strength of the Hamiltonian is the frequency uh, that appears in that system. Now, the interesting point is that this applies in general. Okay, this simple observation from, from a single qubit, single oscillator case, can be generalized to having exponentially many, uh, many oscillators. So, for this particular encoding, yes. If you were to change the encoding, then you will have to change the Hamiltonian. So, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, as I said, build steps slowly and, and, and try to get to a formal definition of a problem where uh, our construction works. You can uh, change the definition of the problem and come up with a different Hamiltonian that is going to be uh, suitable for that case. So, at this point, some questions are, what do we mean by simulating classical oscillators precisely? How difficult is to construct or simulate the Hamiltonian related to what you were asking? Uh, how difficult is to prepare the initial state? What interesting computations can be done? What's the overall complexity of some computations? And, and how the, you know, that complexity compares to, 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 to the one of classical algorithm for the same problems? So the rest of my talk is going to be about that. And um, next I'll, I'll give some problem definitions and the main results. So, um, basically, from what I was explaining, this is, uh, I'm going to define one particular simulation problem, but, uh, but again, uh, as I mentioned, you, uh, some variants of this problem can also be, uh, can be analyzed. So, for this particular problem, which I got problem one, we're going to assume that we have access, somehow, access to the matrix M and kappa, and, uh, the standard type of access that we use for quantum algorithms is called, is called query access. Basically, what I mean here is the following. I never want to write down these big matrices. Otherwise, that would all already require a cost, which is polynomial in big N. Instead, I assume that I have query access, which means that if I ask for what is the entry, say, JK entry of the matrix on input JK, there is some sort of black box that uh, outputs that corresponding entry. So whenever I use this black box, I'm going to say, you know, I, I pick cost one, basically. I use one query. So I'm going to assume that that's the case for both of the matrices. Now, in terms, if you're thinking about applications, you know, I mean, what is a setting where something like this could be realistic? Uh, I mean, that, that's a question, you know, you, you'll have to basically to think about that specific problem, because if you need to specify each oscillator individually, this is not going to work, okay? Unless you have some sort of way of compressing that information such that you never pay a cost big N. I'm going to assume that the system, this network of oscillators is D sparse, uh, meaning that D is going to be like the degree of the graph. Uh, the quantum algorithm is going to have a cost that depends on this d, so if d were to be exponentially large, that, that could be problematic for us. So for now, think of this d as being a constant, or you know, maybe it's at most something polynomial in little n. We're going to assume that we have access to a unitary that prepares the state at time zero, and the goal of this problem one is basically preparing the quantum state uh, that I mentioned before. The first n entries encode the square root of the kinetic terms, the following order n square entries encode the square root of the terms that appear in the potential energy. There has to be a renormalization constant because it stays normalized, and that renormalization constant is going to go with the inverse of the square root of the energy. So that's problem one. So what result we have? Well, uh, that there is indeed a quantum algorithm that solves that problem, that prepares that state, and uses that query that I mentioned, Q times, and an additional number of gates, G. But the interesting thing here is that this Q and G are almost 
Uh, linear in the evolution time, tau here um, goes with evolution time t times some constant. I explain what this constant is later. And other factors, like for example, what is the precision that you want? If it is epsilon, you have to pay some logarithmic factor in epsilon. And, um, and, and the interesting point here is that big N only enters inside the logarithm. So I never pay a polynomial cost in big N. The cost in time is almost linear. This cannot be improved because of some non-fast forwarding theorems that we know from the literature. And the other interesting factor is that this constant that appears here can actually be related with the highest eigenfrequency that appears in your system. So if you are trying to simulate the whole dynamics of that classical system where particles are oscillating and so on, and you know you are point-wise simulating the thing, well, you will have to pay a cost if there is a single, you know, one of the particles or one of the modes is oscillating really fast. I'm trying to faithfully reproduce all the dynamics. Okay, so that is entering basically uh, in this constant that is here, which can be thought as, as like the largest echo and frequency that is appearing in the system. This is sparsity. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, in, in addition to this, we need to add the complexity of what is uh, preparing the state at time zero. Okay, so this is the cost uh, of the algorithm that uh, basically applies to a state at time zero. Yes, that's the question. If you have, for example, block improving up can you use QSP to get the same result? So we, uh, okay, so we get, we, we get to here by using something like QSP or, or LCO, but this is, you know, I mean, K and, we are not simulating the, I mean, the dynamics of K and M, right? I mean, we are, we are, trying to, we are doing a reduction from, from the classical dynamics to the quantum dynamics, and, and, and I, I'll explain how we get there. Yes, yes, it's not as trivial as simulating K or M using yeah. blocking code. Yeah. Yeah, so to prepare that initial state, yeah. uh, if, the, if the, uh, the wave function uh, um, the coefficients uh, yes. is uh, are efficiently integrable. There is a grover and a Randolph okay. algorithm which will be able to help you to do that. I just wonder how is your method compared with? So I I don't know about the approach that you are telling me. All I can say is that in general, preparing the state at time zero is going to take exponential time. Yes, but not always, right? And and the sum assumption is going to be. Uh, true. For example, if the initial state were to be sparse, then you have to pay a cost which is, you know, uh, might be proportional to the sparsity. Okay. So there, there's a number of techniques for quantum state preparation that can be used in this area as well. Okay. 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 So but so by worst case, it's going to be exponential. I agree. Yeah. That's so right. I'll be I'll be careful with the okay. way that I define things, okay. you know, yeah, and, and not sparsity. over make overstatements. Sure, <laughs> sure. To look at because uh, the only criteria for that is very efficient. Algorithm is the coefficients yeah. can be described by a function, and that yeah. function is e yeah. efficiently. I mean, the, the, there's a big body of research on quantum state preparation, and um, you know, any of such technique might be applied to this case. Yeah. And worst case is going to take exponential time. In which then it's not workable, right? For that case, no. Uh, yeah, that's why there's a number of assumptions that have to be met in order to explain the exponential speed up. All right. Okay. So. You have, yes. Sorry, this is a property of the classical system that I'm not as familiar with, but can the largest eigenfrequency have even like weak dependence on a number of oscillators, or how should I understand? Those are very good questions. And, and the answer is yes, but many times no. <laughs> okay? But in the worst case, could it be linear in the number of oscillators? Well, so, so for, for this, uh, in the setting that we are, it's going to be, because I'm considering like a bounded degree, you can prove that the largest eigenvalue of the matrix A is bounded by something that is uh, independent, okay? Um, so actually, you know, when, I, let, let me see, is it here? Yeah, so here are the parameters, you see? Um, so, so this largest eigenfrequency here is going to be, of course, going to depend on the sparsity, okay? And, and there is this well, a left symbol, that is basically the largest spring constant over the minimum mass. So this is what I mean by largest eigenfrequency appearing in the system. In reality, uh, uh, the, we are using order notation, so there, you can improve upon this parameter. Because you know, I mean, uh, although this is 
I'm, I'm being very conservative here, right, by, by what I call the uh, largest single frequency. All right. So once you prepare that state, you may ask, OK, what can I do with it? Well, if, if you're encoding the kinetic energy and you're encoding the potential energy, it seems like that state is useful to compute properties related to energies. And that is indeed um, uh, the case. Uh, you, with that state, you can estimate the kinetic and potential energies in, the, in, in, in this way. Again, we're assuming that we have this query access to the matrices. Uh, we are assuming the system is sparse, that you can prepare a state at time zero. And the goal of this problem is to compute the ratio, for example, of a kinetic energy of a large subset of oscillators with respect to, you know, uh, normalized by the overall energy of the system uh, in the way that if this kV of t, where v is a large subset of oscillators, you compare it with its kinetic energy renormalized by the overall energy, we want that with imprecision epsilon. So we have to renormalize by the overall energy of the system. So that's the goal of, of this uh, second problem, computing the kinetic energy of a large subset of oscillators at any time t, renormalized by the overall energy with some precision epsilon. And, and we know that we can solve this problem efficiently in time polynomial in little n, and the other parameters appear in the problem by using the quantum state that I had before. It's just checking how the state is supported. For example, if I look at the first m entries of uh, the support of, uh, of that state on the subspace spanned by the m first vectors, that will correspond to the kinetic energy of a subset of oscillators corresponding to the subspace. So it's a very simple uh, thing that we can do with, with, the, with the state psi of t. So the interesting thing is that um, any classical algorithm that solves that same problem, I show you basically I will, I will, quantum algorithm can solve it in polynomial time, but any classical algorithm that solves that problem with high probability, we prove that it must take exponentially many in little n queries to the error code for kappa. And this lower bound actually holds for very, very simple uh, systems where all the masses might be the same, all the spring constants you know, might be zero or one and so on. And where the initial state is simply something that is, uh, you know, like one amplitude one and all the rest being zero. Like one oscillator has some energy initially and everything has basically zero energy. So that particular problem, we can prove that, um, that any classical algorithm is going to take exponential time in the query model. So uh, this actually proves that our quantum algorithm can solve certain or other problems exponentially faster even for very simple systems. There's a modification of that problem to estimating the kinetic energy where um, we call it problem three. So it's like we are white boxing basically the, the queries uh, to make a stronger statement, complexity statement. So in this case, rather than assuming I have query access uh, to those matrix elements, I'm going to assume that there, is, there are polynomial size quantum circuits that allow us to access those matrices. So that's kind of like uh, the main modification. And um, instead of looking at, at the kinetic energy of a very large subset of oscillators, now we are looking at the kinetic energy of a single oscillator, and we need to decide whether that energy is very large or it's very small. Okay, it's a decision problem. So this is a decision version of problem two, where uh, we're kind of getting rid of, of, of these queries and, and, and computing those quantities uh, using quantum circuits. So why we do this? Well, because we want to prove like a stronger uh, complexity result that does not apply uh, you know, to, the, uh, to the query model alone. So again, this problem can be solved efficiently with our quantum algorithm for the same reasons before. Uh, we just prepare the initial state, we let it evolve, and then we check whether that oscillator has large kinetic energy or not, which could mean is this particular base state has large amplitude or large probability, uh, appears with large probability when I make a measurement or not, so that we can decide simply using our quantum algorithm. Can I ask you something? Yes. What, what does it mean to 
projective measurement? Is there some uh, precise definition? Or? Of a projective measurement? Yeah. yeah, so I'm thinking about a measurement in the computational basis. So you have this quantum state, which is a superposition, like a massive superposition. Now, uh, you know, there's a system of little n qubits, and now you measure whether each qubit is in the zero or one state. You make a projective measurement of each of the qubits. So this is what I, yeah, that, that at the end, for example, in this particular case, you're going to have a string of zeros and ones, let's say. Uh, about the, the decision problem, is it possible to do the same uh, kind of problem for the potential energy instead? Yes. Right. Yeah, that's in the paper. <laughs> yes. What do you mean by large or small? In this case, large or small compared yeah, to Yeah, yeah, so, so I, I, it's defined there. Oh, uh, you know, it's at most something that is exponentially small, and, you know, and it's like e to the minus square root of n and versus 1 over poly. And, and there's reasons for choosing the parameters in this way, but it's, it's not really too important. It's just, you know, saying almost 0 and almost 1, something like that. All right, so the, the next thing is that we can prove that this problem is, uh, just give me one sec, is in... Um, it's what we call a BQP complete problem. So the BQP class is the one where all, all problems that are in BQP can be solved efficiently uh, uh, using a quantum computer. A BQP complete problem is like the most difficult problem in that class. It's something that we believe is cannot be solved polynomial time with a classical algorithm. And, um, and so this is kind of like the best a quantum computer can do, all right? Uh, you know, the, the hardest problem a quantum computer can solve in polynomial time. And that actually uh, result holds even for very simple, again, systems of oscillators, very simple initial states, and so on. So this gives further evidence that the quantum algorithm we have can solve problems related to the simulation of classical oscillators, exponentially faster than classical computers, uh, even when you have uh, explicit secrets for, for all the operations or for accessing the matrix that we had before. Yes? Yeah, just try to clarify when you say you can solve the problem. Yeah. And uh, the one of the questions you're asking is whether the kinetic energy is big or, or small yes. by projective measurement. Yeah. It, do you require sampling? I mean, towards the end, your solution seems to be encoded in the amplitudes, right? Yeah. And when you do project measurement, it's probability. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So do you have to do lots of sampling and to, to say... No, no, no. For this problem, only polynomial in little n is going to be sufficient, right? Because I'm trying to distinguish uh -huh. between, do I have, you know, it's, it's like uh -huh. simple, uh -huh. simple frequency counts. You measure a few times and you need to decide whether it's 1 over poly n, probably. So after poly in little n, you have to see at least one appearance of that particular uh, basis state. And if it doesn't appear, then you know, you're going to claim, no, the, the kinetic energy is small. Of course, we have probability. Yeah. Right? So okay. this little n is a number of qubits, or it's the, the, the number of states? Yeah, so little, little n is going to be the number of qubits, right? So, so I went from number big n. Actually, the number of qubits is going to be polynomial little n, to be very precise. But it's fine if you think of little n as being the number of qubits. Yeah. All right. So how more do we have? Okay. <laughs> Ten with questions or without questions? Okay, good. All right. So that gives me more time to go through. Okay, so I'll, I'll sketch quickly the proofs of these results and uh, because I want to make a, a, an interesting comment by the end. So uh, if you have questions about the proofs, then I'll, I'll be happy to answer them after my talk. So how is that? Um, remember, problem one was about preparing that state. Okay, where you know, we did some change of coordinates, but basically you know, what, what, some amplitudes are the square root of the kinetic terms, the others the square root of the potential terms, and so on. So what we did in that case is uh, instead of taking the square root of A that we have, because we cannot use it for this particular encoding, remember square root of A is n by n. Now I'm working with vectors that are dimen dimension n plus something that, which is order n squared. So we are using different encoding. We have to deal with different Hamiltonians. But basically, it's uh, about finding a particular factorization of the matrix A as something like this B times B dagger, okay? So for any such factorization, you can prove that uh, you're going to have some sort of Schrodinger equation resulting from there, basically because, uh, you know, if you have this, you derive it again, you get this guy. So if A, you can somehow re relate this H squared with A, well, that's a good place to start. 
Um, and then, um, you know, you, you can prove that after doing that factorization, basically uh, any state that takes this form is going to be Schrodinger's equation. For the particular uh, encoding that we're using, well, it turns out that there is a factorization like B times B dagger, where B is going to be related with the incidence matrix of the graph. So I'm giving you here an example of how things are going to look like. Of course, I don't expect you to remember, but I'm just saying that there is a, we have to start from a factorization of the matrix A, and once we reach this B, we can build the Hamiltonian that takes this form, and this is the Hamiltonian that we are simulating. So there is this uh, classical to quantum reduction that is uh, using this factorization here. Yes? Can I ask a question? So for sparse M and sparse K, is it always the case that B is going to be sparse as well? Or is it because of the special structure of the harmonic oscillator? No, no. So, so B preserves the sparsity of the, of the network. <laughs> yeah. I see, I see. Yeah. So there, there's an, an interesting, you know, at the, at the higher level, <laughs> it's an interesting observation that the sparsity of the network actually appears in each of the rows, but the columns are just too sparse. <laughs> so because of that, uh, when I showed this, I don't know if anyone caught the result, but uh, let me see. So the complexity that we get goes with the square root of the sparsity. Typically in Hamiltonian simulation, it goes with the sparsity. But we get to the square root of the sparsity because of the factorization where uh, B is only like D sparse, uh, like it's D row sparse and not, it's only. Uh, my question columns. was, is this D sparsity the same B for K and, uh, and N? Or yes, so for K, yeah. Can be proven yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. yeah, it's the sparsity for K. Yeah, right. yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Good questions. Okay, so. H is sparse, then, you know, at that point it's really a history about uh, Hamiltonian simulation, and this is some of the observations that I uh, mentioned before, that yeah, there are some constants that appear, you know, from these plug encodings, and of course you should be paying some higher costs whenever the largest again frequency is larger, right? Because we're trying to simulate the dynamics. If I had an oscillator that's oscillating really fast, well, of course, my Hamiltonian has to somehow to acquire that complexity. So how is that we prove problem two, uh, theorem two, about the, um, the classical hardness of uh, basically uh, measuring the kinetic energy of, of an oscillator? Well, we actually, in this case, we, uh, we use a reduction for something, uh, some problem that is called the glue trace problem. So I mentioned quickly what the, this glue trace problem is. So these are basically two binary trees, which are randomly glued in the middle. So this problem has been studied many years ago. And um, each of the nodes uh, in, each, in, in, in these trees are labeled by some random bit string. And uh, you have query access to the adjacency matrix, meaning that if I give you one node, you're standing one side, you can, use, uh, you, you know, you can query the adjacency matrix, it's going to tell you what uh, the neighbors are. Okay. So given that uh, access, the goal is the following. If I tell you what a label for the entrance node is, the goal is to determine what the exit node, a label for the exit node. So uh, as I said, uh, this is called the glue trace problems being um, used uh, in this paper by Andrew Charles and others. And um, okay, so, so this is, um, um, you know, uh, the definition of the problem. So here the depth uh, is going with little n, meaning that the number of nodes is exponential in little n. And in that paper in 2003, it was proven that classically, you need exponentially many uh, query calls to find the exit if you know what the entrance is. So if you were to take like a classical random walk, then uh, you, know, you might be able to advance up to the middle columns, but once you get there, because things are randomly glued, you're gonna get stuck and you don't really know where you're moving, okay? So it takes exponential time, classically. So this was proven in that paper. So what we did here was to take the same graph and now convert it into uh, a system, a large system of masses connected with the springs. So we replace each of the nodes of the graph with a mass being one, each of the edges in the graph with a spring of spring constant being one for some technical reasons we had to attach 
uh, these guys to, to, to a wall. And um, you, know, you can use basically uh, a similar analysis uh, that it wasn't done in that paper, but for basically uh, for quantum dynamics, now it's going to be for classical dynamics. You end up having some uh, sort of Newton's equation. But one interesting feature of this problem is that it reduces to the classical dynamics basically on a line. Okay? So it's kind of like, well, I have an oscillator here, and now I know what that guy is. I have to wait some time and learn something, some property about the, uh, the last node, which is going to be related with the exit node in the graph. Okay, one quick question. Yes. So the connectivity between these in the middle layer, I and mean, how is that represented? How is that? Oh, through the GCC matrix. So yeah. You have access to the GCC matrix. So, uh, in, in, yeah. so you have query access, meaning that you can ask the GCC matrix what are the neighbors of any one node. Okay, that, we are going to pick cost one for that. But we could argue that the powerful quantum is actually come from this quantum access. Yeah. So, so far, I mean, the, the problem is, is, is yeah, is, it's a graph problem, right? Yeah. Right. But when you run the quantum algorithm, not only do you have your, your harmonic oscillator simulation, which is more powerful. I'm, I'm going to get there, yes. <laughs> Just give me a sec. Yeah, so anyway, I mean, I said that this problem, the classical dynamics of that problem reduces to the classical dynamics of a you know, classical system in the line. And um, actually what you can show is that, uh, is the following, that if you were to use our, um, well, I mean, think classical about the problem for now. So it turns out that if initially you hit this guy, okay, you impair some kinetic energy, you need to wait time which is proportional to the depth of the trees for that energy to be transmitted to the exit node. All right? So you can show that. that this is a classical problem. Of course, you're not going to try to solve this in the lab because you could, in principle, you could need exponentially many masses and so on. I mean, this is really unrealistic uh, setup. But you can use um, our, uh, basically, our reduction from classical to quantum systems and use our quantum algorithm because you know, the way that we define the problem, it kind of like meets all the requirements for the quantum algorithm to be efficient. So initially, the state is going to be simple. It's going to be a state that has one sparse, only one amplitude is one and everything is zero because this guy only has kinetic energy. And then I need to wait time, which is proportional to the depth, proportional to little n, to see that that energy propagated to the exit node. A simple way of seeing this is because the way, classical way propagates ballistically and has told you that this problem reduces to a problem in a line. And at the end, that, that, that exit now is going to acquire some energy, and this is something that we can uh, detect in, uh, efficiently with our quantum algorithm. So this problem can be solved with our quantum algorithm in polynomial time in N. It's a different solution to that was provided in the 2003 paper by Andrew Charles and others. And um, because we can solve this problem in polynomial time on a quantum computer using our quantum algorithm, and any classical algorithm could take exponential time, that proves that theorem. All right. So actually, similar, um, yeah, I'm going to run out of time, but um, similar observations can be uh, applied to uh, the simulation of other classical systems and obtain other type of speedups, like Grover speedups. There's a way of thinking of uh, like a classical version of Grover's algorithm. You use our classical to quantum reduction, and that gives you another way of solving such problem. So how is that we prove this other uh, theorem about uh, BQP completeness? Again, I, I'll, I'll try to be very quick. So I told you that uh, there's this problem associated with estimating the kinetic energy of a single oscillator that is in the BQP class, and actually is BQP complete, meaning it's one of the hardest uh, uh, problems in, in that class. The fact that the problem is in BQP, well, that's given by the algorithm that prepares the state. And uh, what it remains is to show that that problem is BQP hard, meaning that anything a quantum computer can solve in polynomial time can be cast as one of these problems of classical oscillators, exponentially many of them. <clears throat> So um, the, the way that we, we, we did this um, 
result basically was by, by uh, considering yet another BQP complete problem, which is the, uh, the simulation of universal quantum circuits, and showed that for any quantum circuit, there is a corresponding classical system of oscillators that would give you the, um, the, same, uh, the same output, basically. So, um, yeah, let, let me see how, I'll try to be quick here, let me see. So, so basically, I mean, what we did was, um, it was that, take any quantum circuit, and to, to that quantum circuit, we, we use some sort of um, circuit to Hamiltonian reduction. There's some standard techniques for this. But what we end up having is a matrix A that describes a large system of oscillators connected with the springs, where all the spring constants you know, the number of oscillators, the masses, and so on, can be obtained from properties of the gates that appear in that circuit. So at the end, uh, you can evolve that, that system, very large system of oscillators, for time that is polynomial in the size of the circuit. And when you detect whether a particular uh, kinetic energy is large or enough, or, or small, you can detect, you know, it's equivalent to detecting whether, for example, a measurement on a single qubit output by that uh, but that quantum circuit has polarization, which is large or enough, or small, uh, which is a well-known uh, BQP complete problem. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, but I'm happy to, to explain this in more detail later. All right. So that's kind of, you know, schematically what we did. We took any quantum circuit and we map it to a system of oscillators and, and, and springs. All right. So. Yeah, let, let me make a few comments um, because I'm running out of time. Um, so, you know, one thing that I mentioned is that our quantum algorithm can be generalized to, to simulate other classical systems that appear in the harmonic oscillator. Uh, the techniques are very similar. It's just that, um, you know, it might use a different way of factorizing the matrix A with a different encoding. Okay, so. The, I want to make a comment about some related work, and I'm going to stop here after um, just in a few minutes. So, prior to our work, there was uh, there was a paper on uh, on a quantum algorithm for simulating the wave equation. So, um, the wave equation is this is a classical wave propagation problem. This is the equation. It looks very similar to what uh, I was showing. So after the discretization, this is the Laplacian, you know, you, you end up having a discrete Laplacian. And, um, and in fact, one can see that this is one example of a more general problem that we are analyzing, where all the masses could be one, all the spring constants could be one, and they are geometrically, uh, uh, they are connected geometrically local. In that paper, only a polynomial speed up is suggested. So the complexity of that, uh, that algorithm is polynomial in big N not polynomial in little n, like in our case. Um, so uh, the, the only uh, hope is to prove a polynomial speed up because uh, classical algorithms could also take polynomial in n. Um, so one reason why they don't get as far as we do is because the encoding that they use is somewhat different. It's not really motivated by these energy conservations we do. So we were able to circumvent those issues by working with a different coding and considering uh, more general systems where interactions are not necessarily local. I talked about these parts networks, but I never said, you know, uh, masses can be, uh, only need to be talking with their neighbors and so on. They can be talking to anyone. So actually we need all those properties to prove the BQP completeness result. So the question would be like, what happens, you know, if uh, the systems are not, um, are not um, are local, for example, right? So it turns out that there is a version of that problem three that I showed it was hard, you know, in the worst case for classical computers, that is, is in, in, in the class P. It can be solved in polynomial time on a classical uh, co computer. And, um, you know, this is a story on the need of, for non-locality, basically. So if you were to have let me give a sketch you, you know, uh, some, 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 some example. If you were to have a large uh, network of masses connected with the springs, but they are locally connected, and you hit just, you excite a local region of it, then after letting it evolve for time t, 
or there's going to be some sort of light cone where this wave is going to propagate. So that's the relevant problem size now, and not the whole network of springs, it's where the dynamics is occurring. That size is going to be polynomial in time. Okay, it's going to depend polynomially in, in time, and in fact, you could expect it to go with t to the d, like I'm showing here, where d is, uh, is the space dimension. So our quantum algorithm had beautiful cost in time, but it was linear. And it had beautiful time also uh, cost in, 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 in system size that was logarithmic. But because the cost is still polynomial in time, and now we are relating time to the system size, we are also paying, with our quantum algorithm, a cost which is polynomial in the system size. Okay? So that's kind of like the story why it is uh, somewhat complicated finding applications in real world problems, because you could expect that many oscillators will be locally talking to each other. Nevertheless, having said this, our cost is linear in time, while classical algorithms could take time which is, you know, at least t to the d. So if you're thinking, you know, like a three-dimensional system, we are, uh, at the very least, we are getting this uh, cubic speed up. And we might have some other uh, improvements coming from uh, compressing uh, the information in qubit states. Anyway, so uh, I, I ran out of time, I guess, but um, I won't have time to go through all this. And yeah, let me, anyway, these are some few conclusions. I, I'm not gonna repeat myself anymore. Thank you.